what's worked in the present and how can tools be used in classrooms was get even some feedback on that, you know, was this helpful but also what was missing, which we heard some, some good ideas from. Oh, were you? Okay. Um, so that was um, my thinking for this, but Amanda's done this before as well. So I'm going to turn it over to you for a minute, Amanda, to just talk about how often. I mean, in, in previous sessions, you've had kind of this moment to reflect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so something that we've always found useful when working with educators, uh, we usually try to build in something at the end for just like ideas and sort of sharing in a sense. Um, so, like we said that some of us are using census data in sort of different ways, or maybe using mapping in different ways. I had envisioned this being on big post-its up on a wall. I didn't bring my big post-its in there really is at all. So I have little sort of big post-its. Um, if there were any ideas that came to you that you think you could like maybe adapt something that we talked about or um, something you're already doing that you want to share with people, we can just like stick them somewhere and we can take pictures of them as a sort of resource. Um, so I can pass things. I got like normal looking and bright looking depending <laughs> on your persuasion. Um, I stopped at Target and bought some random markers that I think will be helpful too. Um, so we just like passed up and around. I really tried to slide that to you, but I did it. Um, so yeah, just anything that came to you while we were talking, or also how you maybe if you went around the, the fair and saw all these other amazing resources that are in the city, if there's anything from them that you could maybe integrate into what we talked about today. So just to sort of get it out, if you had any thoughts before, like, yeah, so as a way, like, I, I always have this vision in my head of holding onto a helium balloon when I'm at things like this. And there's always that, that idea, and then with the minute of luck of the balloon. Yep. Yep, so get it out before it disappears um, into our weekend. I just think we're doing that because it would have been helpful to the people who wanted to get very big with the people where everybody was just like, who they were and why they were here. Uh, yeah, we took maybe what they were and what they were hoping. So we have around the introduction to the <laughs> and, and then also understanding one particular context that it needs, because everyone's coming in a different set of needs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've often done that as a, like, as people are coming in to, like, what are you trying to get out of this kind of question, mm -hmm. and yeah, um, something like that. I know we did a three-day teacher institute on the Vietnam War recently, which is <laughs> and all of them were like, what I want from this is a deeper understanding of why this happened. And we were all like, yeah, us too. <laughs> but, um, at least it was nice to know that what they were looking for was like, some like, understandings, and then we could shape what we talked about
the way, you know, what I love about it, and you guys are going to create that, that is you've created a tool that is being used globally to tell stories. And it's being used by, you know, it's, it's like a professional tool for journalists and for economists and all that. And so, yeah, it's not an easy to use tool for teachers, but, you know, as an educator, it's very good to know that that is how that tool is, you know, how, how our journalists tell those stories. Mm -hmm. We want you to know about that, but, um, you know, they see it on the news, they might see it, you know, incidentally, but they wouldn't know the workings of how is that happening. But then the humanity is what I love about that example. The deer skin and the kind of mental model of the trading routes. Well, that's just conceptually so interesting. So it'd be, it's back to um, recognizing mapping as a transdisciplinary key educational thing that maybe shouldn't be worked on the way that we have a moment, which is like, you know, this little group doing this, and this little group doing this, and you know, in the meantime, educators are up to their eyeballs just trying to struggle through with curricula that's in the way of this, and you know, and you know just like that. But it's, to me, it's, it is, it's got a real, um, you know, I was glad you chose it. I was glad you chose it because I thought, oh, maybe we're going to pull it together. You know, and have to work on this. But, and we did have examples of how it could come together. Is there a community of practice for educators like you who want to get together and learn digital, learn the great utility of digital mapping together? Is there a specific community? So Renee serves them. They're like our... They have an affinity group that focuses on things like that. Do you think they should? Mm -hmm. and, and you know, but, but I would make the suggestion, so I think about the Heinz History Center, the writing project, mm -hmm. you know, that, that it, it's like partly identifying it as an issue and then getting the key, some, some groups who could orchestrate, who could collaborate to create um, opportunities for educators to, to dig into that. But in, in some ways, I feel like we're still, you know, I don't know if there are places around the country. I doubt it, kind of. I, I bet we're sort of like, like individual educators know, oh, this could be important, but we haven't like really figured it out. Um, I think that's actually a huge like, new opportunity that you're raising there. And the fact that, I mean, even Andy talking about the resources that they have, those are still not, and like, if, if anything, you'd think that a scholarly organization like that that's also supposed to be helping teachers would be a place where there is already a resource, but I uh, get the sense that there's not, right. honestly, right? Like, there's like, obviously an understanding of what he was able to present that helped to be open to different things as well, but to actually have the tools to do this, that part is still missing, and to do it in a way that's like, more inclusive and help to like raise issues that students really care about. As your point earlier about like how about youth, like how are they using these tools? Um, that, oh, that's not that's not been connected. I do wonder. Um, I don't know the difference between ArcGIS and history. I know they're a thing together, but I've never understood that. Uh, um, but I wonder if they have a little bit of. I know they do training for teachers. I've seen them at a lot of conferences, like having materials. But I mean, like, for them to be a part of it, they might have done a little bit of it. And I'm searching for stuff now about that. But do educators know about what? So it's ARC? So, do you know? ArcGIS. Yeah, I don't know what the difference is between them and Esri. I'm looking at map people. I think Esri like, makes you know? ArcGIS. <laughs> Okay, okay. From what I remember from a class, and it could be outdated. Sure. Two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so I know of Esri's story maps. They do yeah. these wonderful, like. Um, uh, and then I've always imagined that ArcGIS is sort of like the back end of that, but I have no idea. Mm -hmm. um, but I see them at a lot of 
on that mm. social studies stuff. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's why you might have a little bit of background to some of that. Mm. Yeah, that's really Esri is the Environmental Systems Research Institute, okay. and they're a supplier of geographic information okay. systems, which is GIS. Right. Not GIS is a form of geographic yeah. information system. Okay. Okay. And I don't mean to see if somebody else uses this. Right. Thing, but, but, but they are taking the organizations at some level, so the, the pedagogical application is not something that they right. do. Right. Big history, but I know there are groups in the, in the city that have not done the history project. But I was thinking about big history as another group mm -hmm. that would be, you know, a key group potentially because it's where the sciences and history can come together and you know just. Mm -hmm. But but I do feel like because we're working the way that it's been done, it's just. Space you have to create with money if we're being really crass, right? Fellowships or programs that allow people to release time from their day job, mm -hmm. whether they're educators or designers, to engage in this. No, I was kind of you all had going with the, the, the cohort model of fluency, right? Is that the similar? Uh, is that true? Yeah. Because I mean, I think that's actually. A but when, when we do, um, like the writing project, we typically work in the summer oh, okay. because that's when educators actually have a little more time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so if you were, I think, if you were working with teachers on these kinds of projects, first of all, they need to actually roll up their shirt sleeves and you know, get into it, figure out places in their curriculum where they're going to work and where they could do this kind of work. So that's one kind of that I think could happen, but I do think there's another thing which is that we're sort of talking about. Like there are these, there are these people, and it's not just here in Pittsburgh. I mean, it's really, of course, around the country. But have we identified this? You know, the idea of mapping as a transdisciplinary potent place to work. Um, you know, and I'll just say like. The writing project, one of the group that we played around with on this was um, a group out in San Francisco called NextMap. And they were doing work with um, paper circuitry and stuff like that. They came in and they had, you guys were involved. We had that little learning party, and we were doing the mapping, we were downloading maps, and we were mapping out where our stories were, we were telling stories, we then began to do the paper circuitry and lay out certain places, and then we programmed and kind of programmed into it. And that was kind of a little play date that we had on that kind of thing. Um, but we didn't go beyond that, except to look at it. Well, that's, so that's a, I mean, that's a question I've had about our time and, and other tools. Like, it is, I, I'm not an educator and not in schools that often is. Is there a demand for this kind of the technological fluency around mapping <laughs> tools, or is that a demand that we're creating or trying so to create? It's not, I mean, here's the thing: it's like what's happening in schools right now. This is now my argument: yeah. is being driven by forces that are out of the hands of teachers and students and the like. It's just happening. So if you had, if we thought about it for a minute and realized, you know. Our students have cell phones. They have mapping tools in the cell phones. This is kind of a key thing right now in our world. We have a story. We, 
we have this sort of moment in history where we really need to understand the bigger story, then you might see it as being really important. But I'm just saying that's not teachers on the place. I mean, I'd love to have, if we had more teachers around the table, I think they would say, like, we might like to do that. <laughs> but that's, but when? Yeah, when are we doing that? I do work both in the community and in schools, and I feel like doing more a larger project and deeper diving around mapping as well as history, as well as humanity, and just like critical theory could happen more in my community-based settings where I can actually spend more time with youth versus like what constraints I have in school and in the classroom and having to be in compliance with standards. So I just, that's like the challenge that I felt. I was really excited to come to this workshop. So I was like, oh, mapping. I haven't done mapping outside of environmental policy management, doing things like that, where we weren't necessarily mapping people and their stories. It was just everyone was just data points, and that was that. So I think for me, I've been challenged with like how can we just bridge that gap between data and information because we do have connectivity in a way that we never had. I think of kids and digital storytelling now, like TikTok and like everything. And it's like at every point, like you have the ability to tell their stories, but like also how do we connect that to history and also connect that to like current social issues and the issues that youth care about in their lives and their communities. Um, to have, and so I also question the challenge of like, what can we do to make things that are youth led and not just centered and focused, um, and actually give youth like a critical theory to actually apply in the system analysis to apply when they're doing this work. Because um, it's like, it's really cool to talk about things that are interesting to them, but also like, how do they, how can they connect this to like a larger issue and not just about like, shoes or like athletes you know that they like but like how can you do something with mapping how can you do something with storytelling how can this connect you with like the history and the challenges that you have in your life and your family so that's what I'm really interested in um, and I also just think of who has access and legitimacy and stability in academia and research and like I think that with all these digital tools we all have the ability now to like create media, but like it's about how and why we're doing it, what we're doing it. So, yeah, I'm excited. I definitely want to connect with you. My table is on a level. I like to read that. I've done lots of, and I think also when we're doing STEM and scene work, like that's like the big thing. It's very famous across the nation. What are we doing and how are we creating, not just pushing youth and young people into those fields, but like how are we also like having kind of like a social justice and equity like kind of mindset already that, that's like built into and going into these fields. Mm -hmm. I predominantly work with black and brown youth and it's like we're pushing black and brown youth into the pipeline, into STEM, state maker fields, but like they're still experiencing so many different forms of prejudice, of misogyny, of transphobia, and all these things. And it's like, well, this is what you have to do in the industry. And it's like, that should not be the way it is. Or, like, I think Pittsburgh also is a very college and research heavy city or big town. Um, so it's like, how do we not just inundate, you know, communities? that have been marginalized historically, which is like another research idea or another project. But how do we actually get folks involved, schools involved, community involved? I think that if maybe we can't do this individually in schools as teachers, like maybe we can do something together as like a community to kind of do like a larger project where youth can come, teachers can come and kind of co-construct this project outside of just like These were my challenges. And then funding and capacity. Because these were very, very grant reliant. 
Sure. So it all depends on like who got the money and uh -huh. what they say. I just had a, a minor little brainstorm, really, just based on what you said there, Ash, because we have to do, and we want to do, and we're excited to do, um, a fourth event, like once the three events have happened, bring people back together and, um, and show some insights that came out of this, but we don't want it to just be something where it's like showcasing insights that came out of this. We want it to be something that can be useful to the community and that can actually kind of you move on. So here's my crazy idea. What if um, that fourth event is almost more like a charrette or some kind of um, moment where youth can design um, based on like what we've heard, but like, help to get a prompt discussion by calling out some of the things that we've heard from our three events and discussions there. But then really have like Pittsburgh's team, Next Generation, be the ones helping us determine what, what's next, right? We're designing around. So anyway, um, because I, I think it's like one of the things that's been rich about these um, moments for us, you know, coming in from outside Pittsburgh, is that we've got youth like you know, folks from Steel Town, or that particularly like J.B. Brown and the folks from the YMCA, Rushton, Rushton. I mean, he had some really neat ideas about what he wanted to like help his students um, have access to. Um, and that's how you're putting that more in the center. Mm -hmm. Just like something mm -hmm. to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. So, any other thoughts from me? I haven't uh, used led participant. No. Particip Corey design would be amazing. I think that um, if we could get maybe some developers in the room as well to talk about these sorts of things. And mm -hmm. we, we'd love to be part of that event. That, that sort of thing. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you so much.